Yeah, well, uh, thank you for coming along this morning to listen to these talks. Uh, when I go to these talks, I always like to try and pick up on one thing that maybe I can use. And just watching that video of Dave, I've got a problem with the next door neighbor's cat. And I, if I can get something that can float over why I'm in, up, up in the bedroom. Uh, so for $290, was it? And can you get little weapons on them? And Anyway, that's what I've learned, so uh, I'm going to get one, definitely. Uh, although it's about FTG, the, really the focus of the talk is more about integration. And um, I will show the FTG, it brings a lot of value to it, and it is a, a, a valuable additional data set to the exploration workflow. Get this right now, there we go. So I'm basically going to go through uh, the exploration process, a simplified view, very simplified. We know it's a very complicated one. Um, talk a little bit about the resolutions, mention a little bit about what FTG is, and then show some examples, and then uh, wrap up with some concluding remarks. Exploration process, you see simplified up there. There's no mention of the political and the strategic and the economic. I'm still one of those people, uh, I do like data, even if it's only a small amount, but review it. And then uh, things like airborne acquisition, aerial photos, been around a long time, there are resolution issues. Uh, seismic acquisition, I am a, I suppose, uh, thinking of Evans graph, I started in the, when the 2D seismic started in the, the 70s, and I've worked right the way through. And the end result is you hope to drill, but uh, it's either drop or drill, or find somebody who'll farm in to share your wonderful prospect. And so that's where the sale comes in. And uh, new technology, full tensor gravity. It is a high resolution exploration data set. It's rapidly acquired. And a final point there, if I press the right one. Focusing seismic acquisition. When you go on shore, uh, I'll show one example. You shoot seismic, you think you're over the basin, and two or three lines you could have done without shooting. So it saves money, and uh, that's uh, another thing. For the uninitiated, gravity is a fairly simple technique. Uh, basins have got overall lower density, and the flanks are normally higher density. So you can see them as series of lows. And You've got global satellite gravity that I'll show some snaps from that later, and that can be quite good resolution. Uh, the ideal world. Perfect. And that's a simple gravimeter, just measuring it. Vertical direction gravity. In the real world, this is the old Ryanair job. <laughs> and... Uh, Gravimeter can't distinguish between gravity and linear acceleration, so they use the GPS system to correct it. And there's the red line, and if you're on Ryanair, you hear the trumpet if you're on time. Um, gravity gradient meter, this is the ideal platform because measuring more than one. It's, uh, oops, there we go. So the difference in output is independent of aircraft motion, they're basically cancelling each other out. So it's the ideal choice for a moving platform. There's the ideal world, there's the smooth, tilted gravity. Again, just to show you what it looks like, um, black box, you can put it on a plane. I presume those are gonna get smaller and we're gonna get them on those things that Dave was showing. Um, we use uh, equipment manufactured by Lockheed Martin. And we run a series uh, uh, surveys either plane, offshore, onshore. Um, um, last year we did a big, well, the year before, a uh, large survey for Saudi Aramco, the Dead Sea. Um, not gonna go into the equipment, but uh, you'll see over on the far side there, this is the gravity one, it's magnitude and direction, because it's just measuring that up and down. For the FTG, you can measure basically all three directions, and each one of those you can measure the vectors of the change 
and all those things. So you essentially nine measurements. Resolution. Top one's just a conventional gravity, same amount of noise applied, and you say, well, yeah, I can see there's a big low up here, there's some salt around. Uh, this one, you might just fit a bit of a low in there, not for show. But this is high resolution gravity for all those positions of salt. And the shape in the model, you can see, is <coughs> basically not high resolution. Here's an example on shore Africa. Conventional gravity. And this is additional data. Picking up signal, shallow to be. But what's important about this one, as you'll see later, is the position of the salt, especially as the play relies on it. And this one here is uh, offshore Greenland. And uh, this is the FPG survey overlaying on it. Certainly some major features, rather than just having that high up here, the high comes along, there's an offset and another high. For explorers, these are very important features, especially if we're looking for sediment input into a basin. So having that extra structural complexity is certainly a big help. Here's the one with the seismic now. So we've got a satellite of, or a normal gravity. Uh, there's the FTG. Go by. It looks like a basin, but FTG sort of says, well, it looks slightly lower signal to the north and high to the south. So let's go back. Didn't do the FTG, just go out and got 4 million, 90 days. Let's shoot six seismic lines around the edge of this basin, try and find things on the edge of the basin, middle of the basin. Um, the oh there we go um, so there's the FTG now um, <coughs> we don't know what this is Bef you can't just shoot gravity and gradiometry without some sort of field mapping it this is a, just a basalt cover to the south I'm giving you the high density don't know but in this particular case this was all over a basement high no sediment at all this one here actually goes into what looks like the lower. That could be the source rock. You really want to be focusing on these highs first, highs out the basin if you're going for the structural play. So for a 2 million and 30 days acquisition, you probably could have saved yourself that much purely on those uh, seismic lines. FTG can come in at uh, various uh, stages. David and um, Ivan satellite, some sort of data, <coughs> airborne, co conventional gravity. That stage, you might want to go for the FPG <coughs> regional. Might have a little bit of 2D. Satisfied. Let's go and focus in. We think we know this base from the source rocks over here. Series of plays up to the northeast. Shoot the FTG. Start looking at the structural complexity. 2D acquisition. Uh, prospect scale. Uh, if you're in an area like the Albertine Rift, you could probably start to use it to, uh, to help define prospects prior to 3D, prior to focusing 3D over the prospect region. Case studies. Taking this from a colleague, uh, presentation a few weeks ago on Africa, 15 sedimentary basins, one and a half million square kilometers. Um, and the average block size, 15,000. Um, these are the normal things we've got to do safely, quickly, environmentally, responsibly, cost effectively. You know everybody's going to be wanting this return on investment. So here we are. Um, FPG, probably one of the best places in the world to shoot it, as Tullo demonstrated up in the Albertine Rift. And this is the uh, East Africa should say the Eastern Tertiary Rift System, the Western Tertiary, the Rift Valley System of Africa, Uganda, Kenya, going up towards um, Ethiopia, Somalia. There's satellite gravity, it's actually quite good. 
You know, see the highs and the lows. And where the basins are. Trouble is, you don't know what. You're in a frontier area. What sort of basins are they? Are they natural sedimentary basins, Precambrian, next to Precambrian, igneous, gabbroi type basements? Need to get on the ground, find out. So it's Tullo, a slide taken from a Tullo presentation. Conventional gravity is the uplift and the FGG. And when you look at the discoveries that Tullo have made, we're just fortunate it's got basement, it's got a nice density contrast with sediments, any drape traps across basement highs, correlate with the highs that are generated from the uh, basement and the sedimentary. And uh, I'll push everybody back to that uh, upstream conference or go on the Tullo website or phone the guys who are doing the business there. Okay, on shore, uh, come on. Talk about difficult areas to access data. Let's shoot a few seismic lines across here. This is actually what was done. They, they went out and shot 2D seismic data. And this is a 2D seismic line. Gravity data there. A slide I showed you earlier, not very high resolution. And uh, the plays that were working were all sub source, so. This is what they hope would happen. They didn't find any source. Obviously, there's no trap. Here we go. This is FTG data now, which was acquired by the company later on in the exploration cycle. Several discoveries. Um, I'll just kind of show this slide now. This was the well I was on about just here, which is dry. This one's dry on the red here, and this one's dry. The salt's actually very, very well defined by producing, producing, producing. These are salt walls, salt swells. So sometime in the exploration development cycle, they acquired the FTG. And it's an additional tool. You can forward modeling inversion techniques, certainly if you've got a bit of well, a few wells, seismic data start to add to the, uh, your model. This one, I'm thanking Ian for this, they shot over a period of four years from seismic data, northeast Greenland, that goes down to 40 kilometers. And as Dave mentioned many years ago, working in BP in the early 80s with regional lines, and 200 kilometers, it was just a mess. And so, oh, there's the Moho, and there was one little reflector somewhere. You, it was, Occasionally had some good refraction data, but this data is excellent. And there's the FTG data. I'll get there eventually. Maybe I'll have to leave it on. Oh, there we go. The area we're studying, I mentioned the Arctic, Ivan earlier. <laughs> Northeast Greenland is the, uh, the seismic data, is the scale of the area. Svalbard, in fact, when we when they shot the data, the base was here, and they basically had that distance to fly to to the survey. I squashed it a little bit just to get it in, just to whet the appetite. There's no deep wells on the whole of that northeast margin. Huge shallow uh, 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 seabed cores and what have you. Here's the 73651. This was gas in Eocene. And then uh, Stack Oil had a, a decent discovery back in 2011 uh, up in this part of the world. So this is the area, and I think the, the results of the first bidding round, which was uh, specific to the cannabis group, eight, nine companies that have been involved with the area for a long time, uh, that should be known in the next few weeks. Mobile laying basically just features at the moment. The geology map I showed you earlier would have been produced by regional gravity and magnetics and the odd refraction with it. I'm adding data on the survey. And what you'll see now is all this additional 
flake and it's coming in. And here's the blues there. I'm going to show you that. That's where the salt is. So area A, area B, line one. The methodology is interpreting the seismic. These seismic lines are north to 40 kilometers from zero, some of them to 400 kilometers. Introduce the, in this particular case, we're just looking at the gravity, modeling the gravity curve for the seismic. And you keep basically going through that iteration until you get a match of the data. And you do this for as many lines as you've got. High density on the strike line, if you've got a tag it there, start thinking about the 3D architecture. Update the 3D model. Just building it. So that's the conventional seismic interaction <coughs> of potential fields. Here's seismic now with a, a nice 3D uh, slice of the uh, gradiometry data. Um, Let's concentrate on this area. This is just a very, very simple example to show you how things can change. So, basement. There's a mismatch here. It's too high. So we've got to do something with this terrace. Does the basement really come down here? In this particular case, <laughs> missing that. We've got to start looking to change the density in this region. Is it actually a terrace with some Triassic in the foot wall? Slightly lower density. And then there's the red match at the top. Here's another one. Again, this is down to 16 kilometers. The actual section goes all the way down to 40 kilometers. There's an offset between the basement gravity high and the magnetic high. And the modeling just says there's some magnetic material over here, not some uh, magnetic material over here. And you actually go and look at the data in a lot of detail. Don't forget this line's uh, 140 odd kilometers, just that snapshot. The line's actually 400 kilometers. <coughs> so we're starting to understand we've got different susceptibility. There's different seismic character in here. There's virtually no coherency in the data. But in this area here, there is coherency in the data. And that's where basically this is the FTG, trying to match these major reflections and in points that will be shallow faults possibly, but they'll be influenced by the deeper structure. So there is a, might not be seen exactly this deep fault, but the response of the upper section over that deep fault produces an effect on the FTG. You start building these as uh, all this data coming together. What we actually see now, when you start putting it together, is this is the magnetic signal uh, that was shot during the survey. And this is really highly magnetic basement. And what seems to be where you get coherency in the data above, this looks as if it'll be a detachment between metasediments and what's something that's highly magnetic. Go on shore Greenland, you can see the shears, the, four, the thrust planes, and you'll get this division of metasediments and magnetic material. Chances are we've got very similar geology in the basement architecture of northeast Greenland. 400 kilometer line, now this is going to be testing. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Norway was once very close. Um, first time I've danced in years. Um, so we start thinning, Norway starts to move away, and you'll start to get the crust thinning, so you expect to see some dikes, some sills, the volcanic margin, and eventually you get the mid-ocean and Norway over there somewhere. So understanding a development, that's the seismic backdrop's taken off, and all I'm gonna do here, hopefully, if this will react quickly, we know that's Precambrian, those little islands as you fly up that uh, coast, of uh, Greenland, it's all Precambrian, little islands, fairly shallow water. So we've got that as a block there. We know that depth piece of data. So I'll, I'll put that into the model. And then basically, I'm going to go very quickly. <laughs> Repetitive strain injury. I want to have got mantle, basement, 
architecture, commercially, spatial. It's interesting, obviously, in these days and so on. Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Source Rock, those are there. Um, one line, ready. This is just a grid on there. I'm building up. This is the first attempt to do one line. I just say, what does it look like? Well, it looks like the mantle's getting off and uh, shallow. And it fits together reasonably well. Oceanic crust. Look at a strike line. Look at more lines. Gridded. However, look at this strike line. There's a little bit of a big boom of this coming up. This is about 28 kilometres. That's favoured as being the moho, so we'll include it as the moho, although it could be a, a lower crustal boundary with a top of a high velocity layer for people who like uh, the lower crustal bodies near to the uh, spreading zones. So you regrade and you start to see the offsets. And so what you're doing is building up this architecture by integrating the data. Prior to shooting the FTG, going in some of the ion reports here, we've got 28 little diapiers. Everybody who likes the Central North Sea will be saying, wow, let's get after these 28 little diapiers. But look at the signal on the FTG. And this is just a slice, that uh, northern area, low, low. And all I'm going to do here is basically just Grounded sediment. Anybody who's seen salt and sediments uh, together, salt will move out, you'll get pods. Triassic pods in the Central North Sea, and um, really anywhere offshore Africa or whatever. Sedimentary slope basins, Gulf of Mexico, they're all shaped by the way the salt's moving. So understand that salt, understand its dimensions, and you'll start to make your models for the uh, fairways and reservoirs. Yeah, salt, no salt. Let's just have a quick test of this. Two strike lines there. And we'd expect to see salt here and here. Not at surface. Let's let's go and have a look at the seismic. So there we go. There and there. So really the light bulb should be turning on. Yeah, and we've on the one to the right, we've definitely interpreted salt below there. See it on the seismic. And the thin one at the back there. So two strike lines, one image of an FTG. Starts to change those three little diapiers from the initial interpretation. We're now seeing quite a sizable salt wall. And if you need big prospects to make things economic on Greenland, I'd much prefer a big salt swell with a big sedimentary trap behind it, enlarging the size of the trap uh, to make it worth putting money in. So, this is the seabed offshore Greenland. We'll move the ice. Let's go shoot some seismic. Two seismic lines shot. Let's interpret them. It's not too bad. Looks like diapiers here, here. Data's all fuzzy over here. I'm not certain if it's salt. Actually, these strike lines are going across fracture zones. And the more you look at it, you go, and all of a sudden the data's all fuzzy. You think, oh, it must be salt. You look at it on the FTG, there is no salt anywhere near it actually crossing a major fracture zone. So the seismic line itself is cutting across. The data's all messed up. So let's have a look at that. I think you can see a little bit of salt over on the uh, far side there. But with seismic, it's death migrated. There's no <laughs> deep wells in the area, but it is nice to start to build up a 3D model to get sizes. And basically, very quickly, from just uh, using inversion and forward modeling, you can generate yourself a salt surface. Top salt surface base is a little bit more difficult, but with more input, more effort, you can do so. 
Really, it's about building up all the data, pulling it together in a constrained fashion, one big jigsaw. But in terms of um, conclusions for the FTG, it's uh, it definitely improved uh, definition uh, on the sedimentary basins and the internal architecture. And what Ivan was saying earlier about those basins uh, within Africa, within Siberia, North America, we are shooting a lot of uh, so, uh, FTG in North America for the Marcellus play, the Utica Shale play. People are using it as a, in, in the architectural sense. Um, Structural leads can become the focus. That example I was just showing there, it makes a bit of a difference if you're going into somewhere and you've got what you think are 26 little diapers and you're building up your prospect or lead inventory. You start putting volumes into it, doing all the tricks to <coughs> increase the volume. When somebody comes along, this is, this is one big short wall. The whole uh, size of the lead inventory will change. Um, early seismic can be calibrated to the FTG, and then, once you get an understanding, it allows you then to go and better focus your remaining budget on the seismic. Um, and it's a fast and efficient way, uh, with other uh, data sets, i.e. field mapping, uh, seismic if it's available, certainly existing satellite uh, data. Um, although I didn't show an example this time, a couple of years ago I showed one I'm a big believer in structural geology, um, uh, mapping, walking across traverses, and you go and shoot a seismic line. And we're doing a, some work in, with Repsol in Kurdistan at the moment, and they've mapped all the way along these seismic lines, dip data, everything, and it's all put into one volume. And uh, it's quite interesting the amount of dips that you see at the surface in terms of then saying, <coughs> what would I forecast the position of the anticline? Do I get reverse uh, back thrust or whatever? And now the seismic's coming into it, and the model's already changed probably five times over the last four months as different data sets have been introduced. And when you're spending on a lot of money on these wells in Kurdistan, it's, it's important to at least get your first shot in the right place. East Africa, again, it's, it's still an active place. Uh, and again, Tolo are leading there. We've had uh, discoveries in Kenya. And again, that was on the back of uh, using the FTG to focus areas prior to <coughs> shooting 2D seismic. I think the batteries are flat. So yeah, gravity gradiometry, it's definitely a data set I like to have. And with that, I'll say thank you very much for coming along this morning. David, let, let, me, let me start off by asking you a question. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the core technology here is from Lockheed Martin, yeah? And, and, and it's, I mean, essentially two gravity meters, what, that sort of distance apart, or? Yeah, the, the whole thing is in a machine that, that averaged three XR. Okay, yeah. Now, well they, they would say, I think, um, that this is not as advanced as the technology the U.S. Air Force is using because they, you know, some of you will know this technology was originally... Uh, U.S. Navy. The Navy and, and, yeah. and, and, and conceived of, you know, all sorts of things, finding submarines, chasing down Osama bin Laden in caves in, in Afghanistan and so on. So, potentially high resolution. Do you see a higher resolution coming? I mean, could you get to the level with improved resolution well, together with seismic of seeing porosity changes? I mean, big porosity changes. I don't mean going from 30% to 28%, but, you know, big yeah. ones. Okay, it's puts money into, and I'm really not good at talking about it. We've got uh, a research uh, project, X we call it, and it's exploration gravity radiometry trying to get to a resolution, this Jim, correct me, six times to ten times better than what we have at the moment. Right. And, and Lockheed, there's companies out there that are trying to take this resolution on, but uh, at the moment I'm just about learned how to use <laughs> resolution. Yeah. If you give me any more resolution, 
I'd, I'd love it. And, uh, and as Dave knows, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I started off in regional exploration or in groundwater, regional exploration, and then for six and a half years, uh, I was a, a leading the Brigand field in Kuwait, drilling 40 wells a year, trying to get the Kuwaiti oil production back up. So we were looking at 3D, everything, you can name it, right down to small scale. But now I've got the freedom to go back and do any scale I want, really. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and this sort of six to ten fold improvement, do you think that's a year away, five years away? What sort of time scale are you talking about? If you, somebody were to ask you, you know, so what would you say? Oh, this is your own kit, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Anybody else, please? Yeah. Uh, one at the back there. Yeah. Uh, thank you, David. Um, that was very good. Uh, could you tell me how much one of those Lockheed Martin machines cost? It's, you know, it's non-geological, obviously, but just just the cost of it. Yeah, about eight million each. Dollars. But there's there's Dollars or pounds? Dollars. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. All right. Cheaper, half a pound. Yeah, one. Jeff? Jeff Marsden. Dave, traditional gravity interpretation has always required some kind of a, a separation of a so-called regional component from the residual component, and it's been the residual component which one has then subsequently modelled and inverted and taken forward. Uh, clearly with FT... FTG is a derivative method, I presume. Are you sort of removing the long wavelength regional uh, gravity g component at source so that you're ending up with essentially the residual gravity that you would then start up with when you're doing your integration with seismic, as you've been showing us today? Yeah, the answer to that is that the, the modeling I was showing there, if, if you have got a large regional component coming through, we, we take care of that. Uh, you can either, you know, if you're a detail, say you want to do it yourself, you say, well, okay, this is what it is. So we will produce <coughs> something with uh, corrections made, but essentially we're trying to produce the raw data. So you can have the raw data, and then we all go through a ver a I, you know, the interpreter can go through whatever he wants to do, but you can remove the long wavelength, and that's why we're shooting, it's the, G, the GMA alongside it, which is measuring gravity at the same time. So you've got an independent measure of it. So yeah, that independent measure of the more regional gravity, you can then subtract from the overall signal that the FTG is giving to you. But the, a lot of the, I just showed one image there, the GZZ, which is, you know, I, I was wanting that, and that terrain corrected uh, with a Bouguet correction, 2.45, whatever. That's the image. When you go in and somebody says, actually, some basalts over this, you might well have to go back and start looking whether that correction needs to be adjusted. Right. So uh, my answer is we, we basically try to deliver the rawest set of data that we can to the interpreter, but he will have terrain corrections and certainly when you're flying up and down mountains and whatever, all that is actually taken care of. So actually, can you take your FTG and then effectively integrated back to gravity, or are you actually doing that with a sort of, well, GMA, with another with another graph image at the same time, which yeah, is recording GMA, the full? Yeah, we'll just take the GZ component of the FTG. Yep. We can use that and we produce, if you like, back calculate from all that data, just the vertical component, which is the gravity signal. And I, I could have showed that as, as well. But there's an independent measure of the gravity measurement with the GMA as well. So yeah, the with the FTG, you'll GZ, which is normally just normal gravity, and it's GZZ, GXY, and it, it'll emphasize various directions, north, south, east, west, and um, I could do, do a, a nice presentation on a salt dome, there'll be all the various, in fact, I'll, I'll point you to the opposition, I think it's in, up in Aberdeen in a few weeks, Bell, they're doing a talk in Aberdeen, and they've got one on a salt dome, and if you look in the PESGB, it's got a GZ, a GZZ, and the different displays across a salt dome on shore US. And um, 
people, you know, you can use them if you're looking for particular polls trends. You'll use the GXY, for example, and say, yeah, that really does support where it crosses the seismic. So it's a little bit of, it's such a jigsaw. You're turning pieces around and pulling them together, basically. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Bob. Thank you. Do you find any variation between, say, winter and summer in terms of subsurface water changing levels? I personally uh, am not aware of it. Certainly on the Greenland stuff, uh, the core ice is going to be a bit of a problem during the time of the flying. Uh, things happening. I won't mention that. I've got the words global warming or whatever, and I'm just breaking away. But as I'm aware, there was no significant. Uh, corrections or anything needed and perturbations were. It's a big regional issue. I can refer back to uh, a guy who works for us in America, Duncan Bay. He did a PhD on gravity over, I think it was a groundwater flow area, was it? Or an oil? You know, it was transient with fluid content, but it was high resolution, literally gravity shot periodically and then observed, and it did look at, I think, I'll just say date 94, 2004, something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm making him a lot older than he is. About 2004. And that, and there are other uh, examples. I think the French have done it in terms of uh, gas displacement as well in shallow reservoirs where they've gone and uh, tried it. It's, it, it, it. it's there. If we could get the 10 times increase in resolution that Christian was mentioned and Dave was saying is it coming? I, I think it will be uh, a technique that's got to be used. Yeah, one, one more. Somebody else. Yeah, right there. <coughs> Thank you, Mike Naylor. I was just wondering when you were going to retire the Cessna caravan and the twin otters in favour of uh, an unmanned drone. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I must have now. After I've got the cat, uh, I think I might well do that. <laughs> but it's like, you, you know, I mean, it is logical, isn't it? I mean, the, these, these big drones fly for 24 hours, you know, just keep on going and going, cover the ground at an incredible rate. I mean, it's, somebody's going to do that. Yeah. I mean, I presume the real challenges are the cost and probably, um, well, almost certainly regulatory issues as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, for example, you can't fly a drone above 450 feet in the UK at the moment. Uh, and, and, you know, if you look where they, uh, where my son-in-law is learning to fly one in the States, it's, uh, you know, white sands in New Mexico where there's nobody within a thousand miles, basically. So, y y yeah, there are issues. And I think the big boys are going to protect the ground as well. I, standing next to baby, I can remember when I first joined yeah. BP, big vaxes, huge machines, you know, and everything was linked to it. Somebody brought in a little Apple Macintosh, and everybody said, oh, that looks okay. And it took forever and a day to actually go to letting people use these smaller uh, portable machines, basically. Hopefully. Yeah. Ian, yeah, please. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Now, there's quite a lot of interest in time-lapse gravity, of course. Uh, and if you're doing that, then presumably you do have to be very careful about small changes in ice thickness, for example, and yeah. groundwater changes summer and winter. Is, is that correct? Yeah, and um, really, <coughs> I'm going to the time lapse, uh, I think, as I say, 2004 is the only one I've read with Duncan Bay. Uh, and there is, um, I think it's a guy, Mark Davies, might well have uh, done some. Uh, and again, it's shallow movement, um, you know, top 500 metres for groundwater systems. I actually was a groundwater man before I joined this man at BP, so I've done a lot of... Uh, in fact, I can tell it now, because we didn't get the contract. We were sh shooting for a contract very recently in Libya. Uh, Matt Lueishi uh, was involved, but it was specific with the, gr the Great Man Made River. And you look at the amount of water, you've got water for 200 years, but it's run by engineers. They go and just drill the wells, and there's geology. There's there's water all over the place that's better quality and, and things like that, but it's understanding that detailed architecture. And we thought FTG would be the number one tool just to go and do a, a huge area. So we were very, very close to it. And then two weeks after Matt and myself left Benghazi, um, Paul L left us, so uh, we haven't been back since.
Yeah. You think there was a connection? <laughs> <laughs> Not for me, I'll blame it on that. <laughs> All right, thank you, David. Thanks, Thanks very much. Very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay.